Hi everyone. So uh, over the next, well, actually, I won't tell you what we're going to do next. That will that will come up in in due course. Uh, but we're basically going to be talking about engagement and communication in online. And I've got in little brackets offline classes because, to be honest, I think most of what we're talking about today pretty much applies to offline classes just as much as it does to online classes. But just the, the context that really I'm talking about is, is online, but it would work for offline as well. So before I get into any of that stuff, uh, Jake already <laughs> stole the uh, where are you? And I can see the who are you? Do you want to just type in what, what do you do? Are, are you guys teachers or school managers or trainers? Or, or something else. Teachers, teacher, trainer, online English teacher, 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 trainer, tutor, secondary school teacher, something else. <laughs> uh, worked online for two years, private tutor, French teacher. Oh, that's so cool. We have a French teacher here, lecturer, teacher, trainer. Okay, great. So we, we've got a bit of a uh, bit of diversity. I'll tell you a bit about who I am, although Jake obviously said. So my name's Ross, as you know, this is a picture of me when I needed a hair, Jake thought today that I need a shave pretty badly, but back then I clearly really needed a haircut. This is me teaching, I think in 2008 or 2009, I think, in China. And uh, I was thinking today that probably some of these kids are now at university and some of them might be might be teachers themselves pretty soon. So I started off as a teacher. I moved to China in 2006. And over the last 14 years, it is pretty much exactly 14 years to the day since I moved here and started my English teaching career. I've worked all over China, Beijing, Tangshan. That's where that last photo was from. Xi'an, Hefei, Shanghai, where I am now, Chongqing, Taizhou, and Shenzhen. I'm glad someone likes the beard because Jake didn't. Um, so anyway, I, I've pretty much always uh, worked in China and what I'm going to talk to you about today, all that research was done in China, but like I say, I think it makes sense for other places as well. As Jake also said, I have a podcast. The podcast has been going for about four years. In the podcast, it's, it's a really great opportunity for me to have conversations with my friends, people like uh, you can see Jake there and, and Dave, who I know is also on this call. Uh, so friends of mine, we have interesting conversations, as well as some, uh, I guess you could own TEFL experts or celebrities, like uh, we've got Kathy Bailey on there, Ann Burns, Jeremy Harmer, and Thomas Farrell. So those are all people that I think have been on the podcast, but I've not yet released the episodes for most of them. So they'll be coming out soon. So uh, if you enjoy this and you don't think I'm too boring, then you can sign up or not sign up, but you can uh, subscribe to the podcast later on. But really, sort of most of my, I think sort of my identity is as a teacher trainer. This is me doing teacher training actually yesterday in Shenzhen. And for the longest time, I was a teacher trainer, as Jake mentioned, in Shanghai. We worked in the same team for a little while. And then after, I guess, doing about five or six years of teacher training, all mainly with kids, some with adults, um, but all face to face, about three years ago, I got a call from a headhunter and I ended up joining an online uh, company. And the first thing that struck me about the online company was the, the scale of it. So th this is a picture of me with some of my colleagues from that company. I don't know if you can tell, but they, uh, Photoshop more hair on my head because they thought I was too bald. But anyway, this was an online school. We had 10,000 teachers in the school and 100,000 students, which I just thought was uh, quite incredible for um, the, the scale of things was just unlike anything I'd been used to before. At one point, I was a school manager or director of studies. And I think in my school, we had about eight or 10 teachers, and we maybe had about six or 700 students. So to go from that to 100,000 students and 10,000 teachers was really quite amazing. So all these classes were online, and the classes tended to look something like this. So I've sort of blurred the, the photo of the face of the teacher and the student here. 
to keep them anonymous. But you can basically see on the left there at the top, you've got the teacher, and the bottom left, you've got the student, and on the right, you've got the materials. I remember thinking how interesting it was that the materials took up the largest space on the screen. I think if you're working in an offline context, as I presume a lot of you are, it's very easy to sort of close the course book. And I think especially, I, I guess at almost any level, teaching kids or teaching adults, a lot of the time uh, you have the course book shut. But in the context I was working in, the, the materials were always open. The teachers could never sort of mute or turn off the materials. And the materials, as you can see here, really kind of dominate the page. So that was another real surprise for me. Another thing I noticed was that a lot of the materials that we used then were really adapted from offline contexts. So this very clearly is from an offline course book where students have to remember the vocabulary items. I guess this is food that they've learned and write these um, on the page. And I don't know if you guys think this as well, but when I see this, I think this probably isn't gonna work particularly well online. So this is another thing I noticed. And I think, although obviously since then, uh, many, many more teachers are now teaching online. I think we're in a pretty early phase in terms of materials development for online. Obviously publishers have been making course books for offline for decades. But I think probably the most, there's maybe been about six, seven, eight years of people making materials for online. Here's another example of a, an online activity uh, that's really taken directly from something offline. This is a birthday invitation, and it's really more or less, math, more or less lifted straight from a course book. Okay, so those were some things in terms of the materials. I also noticed that a lot of the classroom interactions that I heard online were not particularly personalized. And there was a lot of kind of conversations like this. So this is uh, based on a role play. Uh, and this, is, I thought, is kind of like an example of a typical classroom interaction that we'd see a lot online. So you've got to say, is there a clothes shop? This is the teacher giving the instructions and the student says, is there a clothes shop? Yes, there is. You can buy a coat, teacher, on the student, on the first floor. Teacher, is there a gift shop? Yes, there is. You can buy a present on the first floor. So not very personal interaction. It's kind of a little bit boring even to read, so I'll stop there. So that was another thing I noticed about the online context. But there was something fascinating that I noticed that was very, very different to online. When I was a teacher trainer, I was very aware that when I would observe teachers teaching, that they would often behave in a different way to how they would teach if I wasn't watching them. And sometimes you would see, I guess, teachers using uh, teaching techniques that you taught them in training, probably because you were watching them, or uh, maybe if they perceive the manager to be watching, they might think, you know, oh, I better use the course book more because I'm being observed. But online, this was really different. So online, and I don't know if this is the same where you guys teach. I'm curious, you can type in the chat box if it is or if it isn't, if you're teaching online. But at least where I worked, every lesson was recorded and it was possible really for sort of almost anyone in the company uh, who was sort of in the management to go online and be able to watch any class that any teacher had taught in the last few years, which was also an amazing opportunity because it meant it was possible to look in the classroom, but for the teacher to still teach in a natural way. There's obviously a lot of uh, dangers with that as well, that it's possible to sort of spy on people, uh, on, on teachers. But anyway, from my point of view, this was a huge opportunity. So these were sort of my initial reflections. And don't worry, I'm going somewhere with all this. This is not just my self introduction. Um, so there was these were some of my initial reflections about teaching online. Some of the disadvantages were there didn't seem to be very much communication going on. The materials tended to dominate the classroom interactions. And the materials often tended to come from offline course books with not very much adaption. 
but there were some great sort of possibilities. So this opportunity to observe and really find out what was going on. There was a huge variety of teachers from different backgrounds, with different levels of ex experience. And it was also possible to test out materials, just to try things, put them online and see how teachers reacted to them and decide if we want to use them afterwards. So this sort of led me to several questions. And around this time when I started teaching online, I'd also signed up for a master's program. And the uh, I, I thought, well, why don't I just investigate some of these questions that I have for my master's dissertation? So these were things that I was interested in. How much communication really happens in online classes? Uh, do the materials in the course book, how do they affect the sort of communication and interactions that go on? And how can teachers get students to communicate more? So I guess over the, what we're doing today, this is kind of working up to this point, we're basically gonna, I'm gonna sort of share with you what I found out about these three questions. And I hope that there's lots of interesting insights in there for you. So. First of all, before we sort of dive into the uh, ideas about like how communication uh, is impacted by materials and how teachers can encourage more communication, let's just think for a minute about what is communication? Because it sounds really straightforward, right? I'm sure everyone's heard of communicative language teaching. I think for most of us, that's what we're meant to be doing. But actually, when it comes to trying to pin down exactly what communication is in the classroom, I think that is a little bit difficult. Okay, I've heard my, my video is blocking something. So I'm going to move myself down here, move it to Doc Manoj. Okay, I don't know what that is. Um, all right, so, oh, but now I can't move on my slides, can I? Yes, there we go. So. I thought it'd be interesting to ask you guys, what for you is meaningful communication? I hope most of you try and get your students to interact or communicate in classes. Um, what does that actually look like or sound like in your classes? Do you just wanna type in, what do you think meaningful communication is? Okay, so we've got information gap there. All right, so that's interesting. So maybe some students have some information, other students don't, and, and sort of passing that across. Uh, someone else has said, when a message is delivered and understood. So that's interesting that the idea of someone else, I suppose, having a reason to listen and to understand. Someone else put having a purpose. I guess that would be a purpose for speaking and maybe a purpose for listening as well. Uh, someone else has said having a message to convey. So I guess that would imply that there's some motivation from the student's part. Uh, Anastasia, is that right? Said real life. I don't know. What, what do you mean by real life, Anastasia? Okay. And someone else says meaningful communication happens when the message gets through and gets understood. All right. So uh, great answers. I think what I kind of found out from reading a bit around this topic is there probably is no one single right answer for what meaningful communication is. And I think you could also uh, view this in lots of different ways. So I ended up uh, sort of constructing a little uh, a little graph. I didn't mention this in the beginning, but I uh, used to be a civil engineer. So every time I, I do a presentation, I end up making a graph. So this is my graph this time. Uh, you can see along the, the X axis from left to right, we've got meaning. Okay, so I guess some of you said like conveying a message and maybe someone listening to the message. That would be, I guess, on the, the more or less meaning side. And then up and down is about context. I think one person, Anastasia, was it mentioned um, something being real life. Uh, someone else here has said it being culture bound. So I guess some of those things are related to the context that the communication maybe occurs or doesn't occur in. So let's explore these uh, four different, uh, what would you call them, quadrants, I suppose. 
So the first one is there is no, no meaning and no context. So uh, here's a quick example of what that looks like. I've called this mechanical drill practice. Uh, and I think this still happens quite a lot in a lot of classes. Nothing wrong with this, of course, as long as it's not the only thing happening in your, your classes. So the, here the teacher is saying, I like cats. And the student is replying, I like cats. I like dogs. I like dogs. So there's no meaning being communicated. And there's no context, right? It's not clear at all why the teacher and the student are uh, you know, saying these things. This kind of reminds me of my French classes at high school. Uh, I'm sure the French teacher here doesn't teach like that. All right, so the second one we've got here is more context, but less meaning. All right, so I think this is an interesting one to think about. There's nothing really being conveyed. There's no meaning, but there is some context. All right, so what does this look like? Okay. So this is an example of, I guess, a, a role play that you might do in class. Let's say we've been learning about food. So we've got one student being the shopkeeper and the other person is being the shopper. And we've got something like, bread, please. That's $1. Here you are. Thank you. So there's some context here. It's obvious where the people are in this, in this role play, but there's no information gap, is there? There's nothing really, you know, everything is known and I guess there's sort of not very much motivation to speak either. So I would call a situational grammar practice. There's a situation, but it's still kind of quite like drilling. Okay, now this next one is also quite interesting. So this is the opposite of the last one. We have some meaning, but we don't have any context. Um, I wonder if anyone can, think of an example of when this might be. Uh, so this word pseudo communication comes from uh, David Noonan, actually. So it's, it's sort of like communication, but it's communication that would happen in a way that you would never see in the real world. All right. So I'm sure I have asked this or, or done something like this before in class. Maybe you guys have as well. So here's a teacher asking the students, do you have any pets? And one little boy puts his hand up and says, yes. I have a dog and the teacher goes very good and then presumably moves on to talking about something else. So is there some meaning being conveyed here? I mean, there is, right? The teacher has asked a genuine question. Do you have any pets? And the student has said something real, right? Earlier, someone mentioned uh, having a, uh, a reason to talk, but if this happened in real life, and I asked, you know, one of you, do you have a pet? And you said, I have a dog. I would probably follow up by saying something like, uh, I don't know, how old is your dog? Was it a big dog or a, or a small dog? Or, or what kind of dog is it? It'd be really kind of weird just to move on and or, or just to say very good, right? I mean, what, what's very good about it? So this is We've called this pseudo communication. So it's communication. There's some communication happening, but there's not much context, and it's not really happening in a way that would happen outside of the classroom. Yeah, is is it Ju Juliet? Is that right? It says it doesn't look like a real conversation. But there's another way to look at this uh, here, and this is using this uh, framework called IRF. And IRF stands for Initiation, Response, Feedback. So this was discovered by these uh, two researchers, Sinclair and Coulthard, back in 1975. And they were not looking at language classrooms. They were just looking at classrooms in general education. They found that most interactions in most classrooms look like this. The teacher initiates with a question. There was a response from the student and then there's some feedback from the teacher. So here the initiation is, do you have any pets? The response is, yes, I have a dog. And the feedback is very good. All right. So again, uh, so sorry, another point with this is some people would say that the classroom is just a context. It's, it's real world because the classroom is just a context like any other. But uh, some other people would say that, you know, you want your classroom interactions to be more realistic than this. Okay, 
So the last one is real communication. So maybe there's context and there's meaning. I actually find this quite difficult to think of an example of, but uh, maybe here's one. So the student says, please help checking my writing. So he's asking the teacher, or maybe it's another student for support, and the teacher or the other student has said, sure, I think you spelled this wrong. So there's some real communication, there's a context because they're in a, a classroom and uh, yeah, some real communication is, is happening. Something's really being requested and communicated. <laughs> so Paul's got an example. I don't know if I should laugh at this or not. Uh, this is black humor, I guess. What did you do on the weekend? I attended my grandfather's funeral. No, no, oh, sorry, I attend my grandfather's funeral. Teacher, no, no, use the past tense. So I think that's a classic example of teachers paying attention much more to the language itself rather than the content. And obviously there's a place for that in classes, but uh, yeah, maybe sometimes we do that a little bit too much. Okay, so that was what te uh, is meaningful communication. Um, this is a slightly different question. How can students communicate meaningfully? Um, can I open that up to you guys? Maybe you can type some things in there. How do you think students can communicate? And we're talking about speaking here, obviously. Maybe this sounds like a trick question or something. I've only got six people typing, so I'll tell you my answer. I think that really that there's a sort of a big range of ways that students can communicate. So at one end, and I think someone mentioned this earlier, they said body language. At one end of the spectrum uh, of like uncomplex speech, students could just use, or people in general, could just use gestures to communicate. Yes or no, or I don't know. I don't fancy that very much. Slightly more complex, because there's some language involved, would be saying yes or no. In terms of a language class, Students might, during activities, use language that they already learned in, in a previous class. Students might use the target language from the class. I think that's often what we hope for, right, when we do an activity that involves, hopefully, some communication that students use what they learned earlier in the class. Beyond that, though, uh, Meryl Swain uh, coined this term called pushed output which is sort of students going beyond their comfort zone. They're trying to say something, but they don't quite have the grammar to say it yet. So they're sort of pushing themselves out of their comfort zone, which is a good thing in that that's meant to help students develop language. And maybe if that happens, so this is just a maybe, so I've put this in a like a dotted line, some negotiation of meaning might happen. So negotiation of meaning is really when some, the person you're trying to talk to doesn't understand what you mean and you have to ask them what sorry what do you mean and apparently this feedback is meant to help people acquire language okay so that's a bit about what communication is and and how students might communicate so hopefully that sort of shows uh gives some shades of nuance to this question of uh what does communication actually mean uh in terms of how activities and materials impact communication? Well, to find this out in this research, I basically looked at four, just four different activities, uh, but hopefully these activities also sort of represent some maybe uh, commonalities with other activities. So I'll give you a quick introduction to the four activities that I looked at in my research. I'll tell you more about what the research actually was in a second, but the first one, was this, I showed you it earlier, it's a birthday, it's an invitation card to a birthday. So you can see here that we've got uh, the student's name at the top right, their friend's name at the top left, the student's birthday on the right. So all that's genuine information. And at the bottom, there's a, a, a space for the, the teacher to sort of, or sorry, the student hopefully, to write directions to where their house is. But really, it's kind of limited because there's only a, a set number of choices for where the student can put their house. So here's another one. This is a role play. So here we have uh, a shopper. 
on the left, and we have a, what would you call them, a help desk assistant on the right. And we also have a map of a mall, and there's a shopping list. So basically what has to happen here is that the student, who presumably is the shopper, will ask the person working in the mall, you know, where can I buy, what's the first, a coat. And hopefully the person, and this is the student's role, right? Uh, so sorry, the, the teacher is usually the shopper. The assistant would be the student and the assistant would say something like, uh, I guess you could buy a coat uh, from cute clothes or pretty clothes or smart clothes. Those are all on the first floor. Something like that. Uh, here's another activity that I picked. So this one's maybe a bit more personalized in theory. So we've got the different days of the week, different meals, and really <laughs> not very much else is there, right? So hopefully maybe this is an opportunity for teachers and students to discuss their eating habits. Will this result in a lot of communication? We'll see later on. And finally, this one. So this is uh, the instructions here are design a shopping center and introduce it to your teacher. And maybe here's the key part. You say and your teacher types. And on the left, we have a blank shopping mall. So of these, just to uh, just to go through them again, so we're all 100% clear. We had the birthday party invitation. We had the directions role play. We had the favorite food survey. And we had the uh, design a shopping center task. I'll tell you before the end, I promise. But which of these do you guys think would be the most successful in getting teachers and students to communicate? The shopping center, the third one, the last one. Oh, hi, Morag. Nice to see you here at the last one. The shopping, do you mean the shopping center design one? Or did you mean the uh, the shopping center directions? Yeah, so Shandy likes the role play. I must admit, I also, when I first looked at this, thought the role play would be really good. The directions, okay, the one with the role play. Yeah, directions, role play. Okay, fascinating. So I, <laughs> to make sure you stay to the end, I'm not gonna tell you the answer now, but I will tell you the answer by the end. But before then, I'm going to sort of show you, we're going to sort of dive into some of the research and look at what some different things teachers can do to encourage communication. So here's an outline to this research I did. In total, I looked at 17 different pairs of teachers and students. So most of the teachers and students uh, did maybe two or three of these tasks. The teachers Remember, these are all teachers online. They were teaching, uh, sorry, they were from either America, the UK, or South Africa. They were mostly female, not completely. Uh, and only three of the 17 had something like a quote unquote recognized uh, TEFL uh, certification, like a Trinity Cert TESOL or Trinity Diploma or Cambridge CELTA or DELTA. <coughs> Excuse me. The students were all Chinese, uh, but two thirds of them were male, the third of them were female. And for anyone who knows China, they were distributed evenly between tier one, tier two, and tier three cities. So that means a third were from uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen, and the rest were from smaller cities. But of course, when you say a smaller city in China, it's probably still double the size of New York. Anyway, after looking at these, I came up with six principles. So this hopefully is the, the meat of the presentation and I'll share these six different principles for uh, for you guys to encourage hopefully more meaningful communication in your classes. And we'll do this by looking at some examples of transcripts. So I should have said here earlier, when I, in this research, I basically recorded videos of teachers and students talking and then I transcribed what the teachers and the students said and then basically looked for 
did they communicate and if they did communicate how okay so this is the first principle and i'm sure many of you already do this in your own classes but principle number one is just ask questions you don't know the answers to um so there's different ways of describing uh questions but very common uh sort of dichotomy i guess you call it or bifurcation is uh, display questions and referential questions. So display questions are questions where the teacher already knows the answer to the question, and a referential question is a question you don't know the answer to. So I'm gonna show you two examples. The first one is from this activity, right? This directions role play, which a lot of you liked. So this is a teacher asking mainly display questions, okay? So the teacher has said, so is there a coat? And the student says, Yes, there is. Teacher says, you can buy one on, you can buy coat on, you can buy coat on first floor. On the first floor, fantastic, good. On the first floor, great. All right, is there a present? You can, you can buy present on, you can buy present on a fourth floor. On the fourth floor, lovely. Is there a storybook? So what do you think? Is there a lot of communication going on here? What do you guys make of this? Yes, there is. So I would say this is there. Uh, so, so no, to some extent, right? So again, there's not really much of an information gap. If we look at this, uh, if we look at this, really, the student and the teacher can both see the same information because it's online. Um, but as uh, someone has pointed out there, it's kind of pseudo communication, isn't it? It's not really communication that would be likely to happen in the real world. All right, but here's a different example. So this is a teacher and a student creating their own shopping mall. So this teacher, this is halfway through the activity and the teacher has said to the student, what about a mini mouse, sorry? And the student here, Oh, no, I don't know. Can I draw on this? Let's see. Yes. So the student has started to draw here at the top. I don't know if you can see me drawing here on the top of this directory. So the student has started to add her own sort of spaces to this shopping directory. And she started saying one, two, three. And the teacher says, you want more shops? And she says, and dancing. My teacher says, a dance shop? No, dancing, oh, and the teacher says, makes a suggestion, a dance school? And the student says, no, no, uh, a dancing school. A dance school, a dance school. Okay, so the teacher types in dance school on this, uh, on this mall and says, good, very nice, very nice. I like the shopping center. Do you like it? And the student goes, yes, and sing, and sing school. And the teacher says, okay, singing school, all right, we'll add that. So there's a lot going on here, but what I particularly like about this one is this student is taking control of the interactions. You remember earlier we were saying that there's this really common way that teachers and students interact, IRF, initiation, response, feedback. Here, this student is the one leading the way. And then we have all this pushed output, right? So this student here, wants a dance school, but she doesn't know how to say it, but she's very motivated. So she said, and dancing, and the teacher reformulates that to a dance shop, and then the student tries again, no, dancing, oh, and the teacher says, a dance school, and eventually she says, a dancing school, right? So she gets there in the end. So I think this is a great example of the sort of uh, motivation that can come from this and, and from asking, uh, Questions you don't know the answer to. Okay, so here's principle number two, motivating tangible outcomes. Okay, so let's look at this same, same shopping center again. So again, there's a very tangible outcome here because at the end of this activity, we should have a sort of a, a completed shopping mall where the teacher has typed in the names of all the different shops that the student wants in there. So let's look at this example here. So at some point here, down at number seven, number six, right? 
Ah, oh, we'll just read the whole thing, right? So the student says, I want to go to the park, right? So remember, we're talking about what shops we can put in the shopping mall. And really what's happening here, it, it doesn't make sense, does it, right? So the teacher is thinking, oh, like, you want an indoor park? And the student says, the many flower. The teacher says, many flowers, cool, all right. And then let's get on to what the name of the shopping center is. So the teacher says, what's your shopping center called? The student says, called? The teacher, what's the name of your shopping center? The, oh, first floor park is, uh-huh. So interesting, right? The student's not answering the question. They're answering a question they think the teacher is asking, and the teacher changes the question again. Do you have a name? Ah, the name is Good Shopping. So there's this negotiation of meaning there. Remember, we we're talking about that earlier, where the teacher and the student are working out together what this language means. Okay, so here's an example of this not happening, right? So this example is this favorite food list. And here, I know this is one of Jake's favorites, right? Uh, the teacher at the beginning has said, uh, tomorrow is Sunday, what will you eat? And the student has said, mushroom. And the teacher says, mushrooms, okay. And what did you eat on Tuesday, blah, blah, blah. And then when we get down to line seven and eight, what about Thursday? And the student says, tomato or tomato. Anyway, Clearly here, the teacher doesn't know what's going on. I mean, what is a mushroom, right? No one eats just a mushroom for lunch, right? But I think this is a classic example of there's no reason for the other person here to listen, right? What, what does a mushroom mean? Or what, is, what does tomato mean, right? Does, is that, have you guys ever just had a tomato for lunch? I certainly have never had just a tomato or just a mushroom for lunch. It doesn't sound like a very... Uh, fulfilling meal to me. But because there's no tangible outcome, it's very easy for the teacher just to go, okay, and what did you eat the next day? Or for example, with tomato, the teacher just changes it to, I ate tomato, right? So I think one of the principles here is having a tangible outcome means that really the teacher and the student have to negotiate a lot more meaning. Okay, principle three, make tasks culturally relevant to students and teachers. Back to this favorite food list. So here again, teacher's asking the student about what they ate and the student types something in and translates it to hemp ball. <laughs> and the teacher goes, hemp ball, hmm, was it nice? Yeah, excellent, what did you have for lunch? And moves on. Now again, if this was real world communication and you actually cared about the answer, you would ask, right? What's a hemp ball? What's it? What does it taste like? Does it have meat in it? I don't know. You, you would ask a lot of questions there. But here, I think because really for this Chinese student versus I think American teacher, culturally food is so different. And I think this is something that's specific to online. Really, it's very difficult to have a sort of meaningful conversation about food. All right, but here's a different one, right, of a, a teacher and a student uh, talking about shopping malls and shopping malls between the US and China. In fact, I've been to shopping malls all over the world and they're actually pretty similar just about everywhere you go. And so here we got all this nice communication about uh, what the student's family does in the shopping mall. And there's a really nice bit at the end when the teacher says, do you like going to the shop? Do you like going to the cinema? And the student says, no, I'm crying. And the teacher says, why do you cry in the cinema? The student, I'm scared. So again, because there's this shared cultural background, they're actually able to have a meaningful conversation about this. Okay, so here's principle number four, is avoiding these sentence stems. So you remember earlier for this activity, we had these sentence stems, right? So one of them is this one here. Is there a blah, 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 or where can I buy this? And the other half is, uh, this is kind of all set out to help the student. Yes, there is, 
No, there isn't. You can buy something, something, something on the something floor. So I don't know if you guys ever do this. I've seen this in a lot of course books. Sometimes I would write these on the board to help students. And, um, you know, it's, it's just a, a scaffold, I guess, for students. All the time someone says, yeah, great, I've used them as well. But here's what tended to happen when I saw these. We got these types of interactions. Okay, uh, you can buy a coat on the, on the first floor. Is there a gift shop? Yes, there is. You can buy a present on the first floor. Is there a bookshop? Yes, there is. You can buy a storybook. It is on the fifth floor. Is there a pet shop? Yes, there is. Is there a sports shop? Yes, there is. You can buy sportswear on the third floor. So what tended to happen when there were these sentence stems is students tended to parrot back what was in the course book or what was in the materials rather than actually saying anything that they wanted to say. And also, I mean, this really is sort of very pseudo communicative, isn't it? It doesn't look like a real world conversation. So it's also very inter initiation feedback responsey as well, I think. So here's an example of one without any sense and stems. There's nothing here, right? So here we have the student is that talking about what he had for lunch or breakfast, I think, today. Today I have milk and stamp board. She says, I'm sorry. Stamp pan. Oh, steamed bun. And then the student repeats it. Steamed bun. Yeah, B-U-N. Okay. So what we have here again is negotiation of meaning, right? The student's trying to say something um that's meaningful for them um so yeah sorry brian has said that the the sentence stems are useful for young learners so yeah i think they can be useful and again i'm not saying anything here uh you know about what is necessarily good and bad in language teaching in general but just the point with this is if we're trying to encourage meaningful communication then maybe sentence stems might actually sort of push students to kind of talk like the course book rather than actually talk like people. So this is an example also of a young learner. I think this kid was about seven or eight and he's trying to talk about what he had for breakfast. And you can see between him and the teacher, they actually end up having this little uh, conversation. And uh, later on, the teacher asks the students, are the school lunches good? And the student says, I don't know what is school lunch. And the teacher says, oh, you mean it's a surprise every day? Yes. Okay. So again, we get a bit of output and negotiation of meaning there. All right. Number five, put communicative activities at the start of lessons. This I think is the, my, my funniest example that I find. So this was from this birthday party invitation that I showed you earlier. So interestingly, this activity was at the very end. It was the last slide in an online class. And so actually most teachers didn't get to it at all. But this teacher did. So take a look at this while I have a sip of my uh, coffee. So this is from the end of class. So this is meant to be the student's own birthday card, or sorry, birthday party invitation. And the teacher says, uh, let's put today's date, the 10th of the 10th, 2019 at 10 a.m., right? <laughs> so basically, the teacher ends up choosing the student's birthday for them because they're under pressure, which interesting meta point. Now I feel under pressure, right? Because I know I've only got about uh, six or seven minutes to finish this presentation. But when teachers like this person feel under pressure, they ended up focusing more on getting the task done. So finishing the, uh, the invitation in this example, or just focusing on the student's language rather than focusing on communication. And personally, before I did this project, I always think you need to have output activities at the end of lessons. All the other activities you've seen actually came from the middle or the beginning of lessons. So I think students are actually maybe more capable than we think of doing things uh, at different places. But anyway, this is what happens when teachers don't have enough time. Here's one from the start of class, exactly the same activity. And this is actually my favorite example of all because this student was so quiet, right? I'll read this one out for you, right? So the teacher says, when's your birthday? 
and the student says something like home. Teacher says, what month? January, February, March, April? When's your birthday? And the student nods. The teacher goes, December, December. Okay, we'll just say your birthday party is on the 20th of December. And the student says, no. Teacher says, no, no, when? When's your birthday? And this little girl goes, um. So the teacher then goes very, very patiently, goes through all of these. January, February, March, April, May, June. And the student nods. And the teacher says, June? So she checks. The student nods, June. Ah, June. Okay. Uh, do you know the day? June what? Do you know what day it's on? And this little girl says, 10. And the teacher says, 10th. And the student nods, ah, the 10th of June. And I love this example because this little girl only says two words. She only says no and 10. And she manages to communicate something incredibly meaningful and personal to her, which is her birthday, right? And there's all this negotiation of meaning going on. And when she says no, she takes control of the conversation. And uh, interestingly, at the beginning, when I asked you guys what communication was, most people talked about something like speaking or the students uh, sort of doing something. But I think it's fascinating that really it's possible to communicate a lot just with two words like this little girl managed to do. Okay, so final principle here. And I think this one, if you're teaching offline and you just have a whiteboard, you can do the same thing. But it's really just get the students to do the talking or make the students the, the boss and the teacher is the, the, the slave, I guess, or the servant and the teacher has to draw. So here's an example, again, both from this activity here of the shopping center activity. So uh, what was meant to happen here is the student talks and the teacher draws, and here's an example of when this happened. So here we have uh, the teacher says, and the teacher's actually, this teacher kind of co-created this one with the student. He says, okay, ground floor, we're gonna have a dog shop. And then the student draws something, maybe I can draw this for you guys, that kind of looks like this, right? And what would you guys think that is? The teacher anyway thought it was a bone, right? And the teacher goes, another dog shop. No, 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 we can only have one dog shop. And the student goes, it's ca. And the teacher says, a cat shop. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And the student goes, a candy shop. This is candy. Uh, okay, so we've got dogs, we've got candy. So again, there's these interruptions coming from the students. So remember earlier where we're talking about IRF, initiation, feedback, response. So here, because the teacher is the one controlling the pen, the student is the one really be, who's being creative. We end up with all these interruptions. And I think in real life, if you're a student, you need to be able to interrupt people and um, ask questions and, and do what this student here is doing. And this student, interrupts the teacher three times to say what they want to do kind of each time pretty um much uh she's not he's not been invited to do that by the teacher and here's an example of the opposite of that so this teacher has said can you fill in some shops what would you like to have so this student draws in all the shops themselves and really no communication happens at all afterwards the student just says you know it's things like uh so the teacher here says, excellent, well done, really good job, well done. So what's on the second floor? What's on the second floor? A clothes shop and a sportswear shop. Okay, what's on the ground floor? A sweet shop. And what's on the third floor? A toy shop and a book shop. So you can see the same activity by giving the student the pen and letting the student do everything. Actually, it ends up that there's pretty much no communication going on at all. Okay, so to bring this back to what we looked at at the beginning, I think of these activities, we didn't really see any sort of drill practice exactly, but there's definitely some situational grammar practice. So the teacher is saying, you know, is there a bookshop? Yes, there is. You can buy a storybook. It's on the fifth floor, right? There's some context to that, but there's no real meaning being communicated. 
in terms of that pseudo communication so communication that some real information is being uh, passed along but not in a way that would happen in the real world we had that example of the, the food one right tomorrow is sunday what will you eat mushroom mushrooms okay right there's nothing really uh i mean the student might be saying something real there but there's no context and the teacher doesn't really seem to sort of um sort of i don't know show any understanding but there were some examples of real communication going on where the teacher and the student had to build something together all right and then to go back to that question i asked you guys much earlier on do the activities make an impact well this was the results this was the number of sort of meaningful interactions that happen per minute the shopping center design was by far the most uh, successful activity of these um i mean i guess what we looked at earlier was a bit more qualitative but but that activity was really by far the the most successful one but something that's also worth thinking about is this is these uh, sort of broken up into every single teacher and student that did every activity. You can see the green one is the shopping center one. You can see there's still a huge spread, right, with different teachers and students using the same activities, which makes me think that, you know, teachers still uh, are obviously incredibly important when it comes to encouraging meaningful communication with their, their students because the most successful teachers were much more successful than the least one, least successful teachers. But I also looked at, remember I told you earlier, I had 17 different pairs of teachers and students. So I broke this down. So uh, each letter is one pair or dyad of, of teachers and students. And you can actually see from most of them that usually the top dot uh, for each of these pairs is usually colored green, which means that regardless of the teacher and student if you know it was a very skilled teacher still a good activity actually ends up encouraging more communication than a less effective one and finally when i was looking at all this i was focusing on the teacher and, and earlier in this presentation i said you know what effect does the teacher have and uh you know what effects the materials had but I also thought it was fascinating, the effect of individual students. And I wanted to share with you something from one little boy. So he was using this activity, which as we saw earlier, um, uh, as we saw earlier, uh, maybe didn't have a huge amount of meaningful communication in it. But this little boy, and don't worry, Jake, if you're, uh, we'll be finished in the next three minutes or two minutes, I promise. So. This student here was really quite amazing. So they're doing this activity, this role play, which as we saw was not very effective. Um, I'll give you three minutes at the end, Jake. Don't worry, I promise. So uh, we've got the teacher here saying, you know, can I go to a movie? Is there a cinema in this place? And the student says, where is the cinema? Yes, yes, go to, yes. There is one on the... There is a gift shop. Oh no, third floor, happy restaurant. What's he saying? No one knows, right? So this, te this teacher says, cinema, watch a movie. And uh, the student says, no, no, you can't, you can't. The teacher says, there's no cinema. There isn't a cinema. All right, can you buy a cake? And the student then says, the cinema, the cinema, damage to eyesight. Yeah, that's right, it's bad for your eyes. Don't go to the cinema, don't go to the cinema. And the teacher then says, okay, can I buy a cake? No, you can't. And the teacher at this point is getting so frustrated. Yes, I can. And the student says, the cake, don't eat cake. Cake is yummy, but is very bad, bad, bad food. Don't eat bad food. And the teacher, I love this, the teacher then says, say this word, unhealthy, unhealthy. And the student says, unhealthy. Yes, and I love this because they've taken this really not very personalized activity and because of the student's personality, they have managed to turn this into something meaningful for them. All right, so one more time, those different principles that we looked at were, uh, number one, ask questions that you don't know the answer to, uh, use motivating tasks with tangible outcomes, make tasks culturally relevant for students and teachers, Avoid sentence stems in communicative activities. Put communicative activities at the beginning of lessons, not at the end, and get teachers to instruct 
and students to draw.